So hey everybody, uh, welcome to the podcast. So today we have something very, very special here, right? So we're doing an amazing podcast with Luke here, my man Luke here, and he's definitely a hat guy. I see those hats there and uh, let's get started. Why don't you introduce yourself, Luke, and we just, uh, you know, get started into what we're going to talk about. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. Um, yeah, so I'm Luke Malks. I'm a VP of Business Operations at Brave and on the uh, Basic Attention Token. Um, and I started working, I came into Brave pretty early. I started working with the company in March of 2016, kind of as a consulting basis uh, while I was working in digital advertising. So I was like really in the, the belly of the beast and then seeing how, you know, Google and a small set of companies were basically eating up monetization over the web and kind of creating a playground for all these other companies to collect everybody's data and uh, and mm -hmm. you know you, you see all this stuff happening the writing on the wall and uh, and then I saw Brave they were introducing a new Brave payments back like in 2016 in March and mm -hmm. it used Bitcoin and it was like a proof of comment uh, proof of concept thing and it it seemed really interesting because not only were they trying to kind of like go after the privacy problems um, that were plaguing the web where, you know, user agency and things like this were really getting ignored. Um, but also they had like, you know, a positive, like generative way for content to get paid for with crypto and, and ways that were approaching that that were pretty smart at the time. Right. And they also were kind of like kicking around this idea of like users getting a rev share. So came on later in the year full time, uh, right around the time we started working on the bat white paper. So I kind of helped co-author a lot of the advertising parts of that of that uh, white paper. And then um, when we started to do the get prep for the token launch in May of 2017, which like literally yesterday, <laughs> we had our, uh, our five year anniversary with bat. Um, so I, I kind of started to see like how important communities were um, in, in crypto. And I, I ended up uh, kind of overseeing the bat community too. So wear a lot of hats um, at Brave and, and bat. And, and I kind of have taken, helped to take a lot of like proof of concept and MVPs into like scalable business because I was in ad operations and ad products before. So you kind of take these ideas and, and these concepts and, and engineers and the team here build them out into like things that actually work and, and deliver. And then how do we scale those up? And then how do we tie revenue to it? So do like business development and operations work now. Correct, correct. So, I mean, in the initial stages, you were actually talking about uh, how Google and other companies are just eating up. And uh, so can, can you actually specify on that and talk about the power of communities and where Brave comes in? Because, you know, one thing that really attracted me about Brave is that, you know, so I'm, I'm based out of India right now, Luke. Right. And most people in India found out Brave not because of the advertisements, but because of the incentive model and the entire bad token. So so what is that? Why, why did I like Brave? Right. Because <laughs> like 13 year olds are completely, you know, migrating their parents uh, a Chrome onto Brave and like, like 13 year old, literally 13 year olds doing that. And there must be something really powerful going on. Right. Something ingenious going on behind the scenes. So why don't you talk about that? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, kind of touching on what I was saying earlier about these companies kind of eating up the web, right? You had a situation where, you know, between the advertising, which was like 90% of Google's revenue, but also a huge part of Facebook. And, and you, then you started to see things like Google AMP that were coming in where not only do does Google have kind of the advertising realm covered and, and all the advertising stuff kind of flowing through, not all of it, but a good percentage of it's flowing through them. Now they're starting to kind of cache content on the internet. And uh, right. I was working with publishers that were working with Google when AMP was being introduced. And they, they first initially was like, oh, here's a new way to create more revenue for your publication. And, you know, AMP articles are getting this carousel placement and this new carousel we're adding in, et cetera, um, which all sounds great. But I remember sitting in the rooms with these publishers thinking like, what's this going to look like in 15 months when mm -hmm. the users are no longer navigating to the website, the full website, they're actually like never really leaving Google search to consume this content. So all of the, you know, longer mid tail revenue on the publisher side gets kind of eaten up because the user can now kind of luxury scroll without ever leaving Google. But you sort of see this pattern happening, not only in Google, but also in Facebook and all these areas where people spend so much of their time and attention. And so I think there's a mix of things happening. One, you know, 
we were early with privacy and not just privacy as in like, you know, lipstick on a pig or, or, you know, like trying to kind of say privacy is important, actually like really caring about privacy. And mm -hmm. the other end of it, we were really early with crypto too. Like Bitcoin proof of concept was in 2016. Um, and we, we saw how, you know, the block wars and all of that, uh, you know, and, and felt early what it was like with scaling Bitcoin or trying to, which, you know, hats off, like you got to start somewhere, right? Like, um, and so, so, you know, you see these two things happening very early and it wasn't us just talking about it. It was our team building this and we have amazing engineers that were doing this. Product, product. But what's really resonates, I think, with people is that, you know, I may have gone into rooms in 2016, 2017 with publishers and advertisers talking about privacy and kind of getting laughed out of the room. Right. But then all of a sudden GDPR comes into effect. And everybody, whether you have a company in India or the United States or Europe, has to comply with, you know, European regulations if they have your users or services in Europe, right? So it turned into like a laughing stock thing into like, oh, whoa, everybody's got to like get on board with this and figure this out. And while that's happening, our team had been building things, right? So like, it wasn't even in this realm of like, oh, let's talk about the best way of doing it. And then mm -hmm. like, like Google still hasn't implemented, you know, third co party cookie locking in their browser. It's 2022, right? Like, yes, okay, yes. we can debate that. We're just going to ship, you know, private advertising, like to millions of people, right? Like we, mm -hmm. we can do that as a startup. Um, we don't have to get strapped with the tech debt that the other, you know, big tech players have and with shareholders, et cetera. So basically though, like to really boil it down, what Brave is doing that others aren't is it starts with user first principles, right? Like in Brennan, if you look at our brave.com slash blog section, mm -hmm. the you know, the product and the experience with the web to, to all the way to how the business models work. And, and we've changed that, like, really, I mean, we give 70% of our advertising revenue back to our users in the form of our token. Like, no one yeah. does anything like that. And, a, and yeah, an incumbent yeah. player, that's like, seems yeah. crazy to people. But that's yeah, like, yeah. That's how fundamental this is to us. Like we want to make sure that, you know, we're not stepping on users or their choices or mm -hmm. their, their, you know, priorities. Like we put them first. That's what keeps us different from everybody else. And I think thought what it, you start it, to it. see like now with crypto is that crypto is like, it's not a zero sum thing. Like we're not yeah. all of a sudden going to see web three switch on and everything else die. Like that's not yes. how technology works, right? Like, so what you want to make sure you're doing is like, protecting users and having this user first approach with web two while web three starts to get integrated. And so what we started to do is look at, see like, okay, what are the protocols that are getting, you know, uh, integrated or that we could integrate in the browser? Like what are the, how can we start, you know, making web three usable for okay. everybody? And we started with advertising and made a couple of clicks to where, okay, you can, you, a couple of clicks, you can start earning bat. You don't have to know how to use, you know, a, uh, you know, a browser extension wallet is there yeah, to yeah. like now we have our brave wallet that we've integrated yeah. we're trying to take the learnings from that and moving that there but 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 really exactly. to answer your question simply like it, brave is more of a mission than uh, a, a single product like what we're doing is not selling insurance or you know selling cars to people we are like Good saying idea. look like this is almost like a last stop to 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 protect any idea of like a user first model with the web in a scalable way. And that's kind of where we're coming from with this stuff. I mean, see, I mean, this, this just keeps recurring, right? Because I mean, even Mark Andreessen was talking about the SSL when the entire SSL thing happened in, in the late nineties. I mean, uh, it was actually banned, right? It was banned saying, uh, oh, who needs privacy? Only uh, criminals need privacy. But now you understand that privacy is needed, right? If, if you're buying something, if you're buying something, uh, you don't want to share it, right? You, you would need privacy. I mean, it, it's like saying, uh, uh, you know, most people, when we talk about uh, Web3 space, they talk about, we do not need so much of it. And if that's when the Web2 part comes in. And it's like saying uh, banning cars because accidents happen or <laughs> things like that. Right? Yeah. And it, it, there's a lot of parallels to that too. I mean, like think about like SSL, right? Or um, like, because this was something, one of the, one of my, my pathway to Brave kind of came through trying to like do what I could from my position to improve security in advertising. Okay. And this was at the time when 
most of the web was not using HTTPS, right? Like, uh, and and I actually, our, our CISO, Jan Zhu, who's Bcrypt on Twitter, like mm -hmm. uh, worked at HTTPS everywhere. And so I was researching a lot of, of her work, right? Like with mm -hmm. Tor and with HTTPS. And that's kind of how I stumbled upon that because she was at Brave before I was, like really early days, right? Like, um, mm -hmm. and so you, these things though, like SSL, HTTPS, like it, it wasn't, it was barely adopted in 2016 and now over 90% of the web is using it. I think that the similar thing is going to happen web three where everybody's kind of fixated right now on the acronyms and like, oh, NFT and yeah, fungible yeah. and da, 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 yeah. da, da, which chain are the you buzzwords. using? It, 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 and and they're needed to kind of describe what the technology is but mm -hmm. when this hits scale it's all going to be abstracted you're not going to care like like i use the web and my mom and my wife use the web they don't know what ssl is they just yes. are a little more secure when they're browsing the web and i think you're going to start to see that with web3 where okay maybe i'm signing from a wallet instead of having to use a Google SSO that is like tracking what I'm doing on a site and tracking what content I'm reading and putting that on a server somewhere. And, and so it kind of comes with these like user first principles where if I have my wallet and it's self custodial, I can sign something instead of having to go through a big tech service where okay. maybe that comes with a lot of excess baggage to me as a user. Maybe I don't know what that is, but maybe there's a better way. Like, mm -hmm. and, and I think this is where the technology partners are like in the space really uh, have to lean in on like, okay, what are the real added values, benefits of web three and, and in comparison to web two? And I think we're not quite, we're, we're getting to the point where people are starting to kind of talk about these things, but not mm -hmm. really. Like most of the focus yeah, is still yeah, on, yeah. you know, speculation and investing and that types of stuff and clickable JPEGs and all the, all these things, right? Like, which, sense, which are, are, they're critical to early down, yeah. but like still like i think what brave can do too is is be an example of like this is what it looks like when you integrate web3 into the web right like in you know we have a search engine we have all these different ways where we can start to surface this stuff and 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 you know include it in the web correct correct and i mean you talk about the user first values right because that that is something that we have lost in the entire web two world when facebook came out and i mean not to not to pick up on those companies because they've definitely built a lot of wealth and uh, they've accelerated a lot of growth but i think we've lost that narrative of um, uh, having privacy and user first right so so what do you think is going you know how is brave going to impact uh, the advertisement industry when you know there's 70 percent of the revenue going directly to the user benefiting them so what's what's the you know what happens to the advertising industry yeah that's a great question and i think like we 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 had to deal with this a lot early like when we were especially when we were first launching or right before we were launching the ad platform because we're in a position where we have to go to brands and get brands on board with advertising with us. And those brands are also, you know, brands that are impacted by our privacy protection, right? Like, and so it's kind correct, of this correct, paradigm correct. with, it's tricky, right? But even trickier with publishers because they're already seeing, you know, negative, uh, they're, they're seeing just like, they're, they're uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, something returns, uh, they're, they're, they're struggling. They're struggling, mm -hmm. right? Like they mm -hmm. are having to do more clickbait less quality content they have to do everything they can do to get people in to the most ad revenue right like and yeah, and yeah. we're we're out there saying nah this is this is whack we're just gonna break it all like and you have to do this in order to have privacy work in a realistic yeah. way right and so what we what for us though what we ended up doing was saying look like we rethought the way that advertising works and and they, this is what really got me excited about brave early was like look if I want to buy a pair of Nikes, like I shouldn't have to have my whole life Hoover backed into big tech, you know, like in order for me to see an ad about Nikes and do something from that ad. So mm -hmm. like, how can we use, and this is where it's cool from a browser because a browser has your, your, your whole corpus of information, right? Like it has your, your, your uh, browsing history. It has, you know, like purchase history, all this Everything. stuff is there. And it's yeah. not like, if you look at how regular advertising works, it's all these different companies that are collecting bits and pieces of your information and profiling them. So there's like all these different profiles of you um, or you have one complete corpus in the browser. So what we did is we basically said, look, instead of having all this matching happen in the cloud or, or with all these mm -hmm. weird parties that nobody's heard of that are collecting my data, match the ads directly in the browser. 
like like almost like an autonomous dr car where the car is driving with the user and you know google's not driving the car from somewhere else the car is reacting and responding oh, to that fun. user native to that user right like and so what we did was we put together a way of serving ads that basically like instead of down instead of like uploading user data for matching we download a catalog of available ads and then we use machine learning on the browser to basically uh, wait, score the, what you're browsing and whether you're intending to purchase something or if you're browsing certain types of content and, and it has a catalog of ads for your region that are you know tagged with types of contents or types of purchase intent journeys, right? And so the browser can match this stuff without your data leaving your device. And then we, we implemented zero knowledge proofs like before people were even really talking about this stuff. Like we, we had Ananize uh, in, in our original Brave Payments and Brave Rewards. And then we started using uh, you know, Privacy Pass token model with, uh, with, with Brave Rewards now in our current implementation for ad confirmation. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we, we, so there's ways you can, you can account for things anonymously and protect the user's privacy, not link a specific user to what they're browsing or what ads are being shown but prove okay. that return on investment. So for us, it's been for advertisers, it's like, look, we don't need to, it's a liability now to collect all this data. What we can do is we can prove that you put a hundred bucks in and you get this output from it. And, and you do mm -hmm. that with privacy. And like okay. that's at the end of the day, that's what the advertisers want. They don't care that you bought the shoes. They care that shoes were bought, right? Like, and, and mm -hmm. you know, they can ask you for your email address and build out a first party list from that stuff and you can supply it to them. And that's fine because that's what you're doing. That's not happening by default, right? But you're, mm -hmm. you're willingly participating with that advertiser. And there's a relationship that's made more organically there between mm -hmm. the brand and the user. That's not quite as like extractive or manipulative or deceptive, which is unfortunately the way that advertising has grown on yes, the, yes. Quo or the web, you know? Yeah, I mean, see the advertising part, of course. I mean, if if I had to digress and talk about uh, the bad tokens, right? Yeah. Because you know what you just mentioned about, uh, I mean, it's just so much to digest for me because I've been listening to uh, the entire uh, Web three space and everyone's talking about this narrative, saying so. So, what do you think? What, what's the vision with the with the bad tokens, right? Because the moment you enter the Brave browser, it becomes its own economy. It becomes its own economy of creators, and uh, I I can dip my own creators instead of uh, you know doing doing something else. I could I could directly gift them. So things like that. It's it's just amazing. So so what so where are we taking this? Why are we taking that? That's a great question. So so initially, like with the white paper and with our the white paper was a little more broad, but the first. The first example we wanted to use with BAT was around advertising because there was a lot of problems with privacy and uh, it, there was a lot of new stuff we could do with crypto, like where, oh yeah, you have an attention token. We can attribute that back, right? Um, but realistically, it, BAT is a unit of account for attention. So like it's much more than just for advertising. Like it's any, it's okay. applicable to anything in the attention economy, right? And what is really interesting because when we did the white paper, NFTs were not a thing. Uh, in in the sense that they are now, right? And DeFi was people were experimenting with it. I mean, March of 2017, right? So this is a time machine back. It wasn't a thing really. I mean, and so what we started to see were as crypto matured and as new innovation happened with crypto, that sort of secondarily became integrated into those things. And then you have precedent where like, Okay, uh, with MakerDAO and Compound and Aave, early on, they started to add BAT as an asset type. And sometimes yeah, this was yeah. through governance, sometimes this was just on their own. But we had a lot of people holding BAT too. Um, and, then, and then what we started to do, and some of this happened organically, like OpenSea added ERC20 uh, tokens to buy NFTs like a while ago. But then we uh, started to partner with, you know, blockchain gaming companies like Gala Games and Splinterlands early on to use, utilize BAT to purchase land deeds with NFTs and do like NFT collaborations with BAT. And so what we're trying to show people is that, look, if it's in the attention economy, whether it's okay. DeFi, NFTs, or, you know, digital advertising, BAT is native to that, right? And, and so yes. you have these, yes. you have on-chain utility with, that can be completely outside of our ecosystem uh, directly. Then you have this kind of hybrid model with our reward mm -hmm. system and that can live in all of these things. And what's super interesting now 
is like fa fast forward to where we're at today, you, we have this native multi-chain wallet where any EVM compatible chain supported, so Polygon, BSC, Avalanche C chain, all this good stuff, um, and mainnet Ethereum, and then Ethereum L2s, and then we just added support for uh, Solana into the wallet as well, where okay. we'll have DAP support pretty soon, but it, it, that's the next thing to come. But what we're basically doing is saying, look, like, we're in this multi-chain era, like as a browser with a native wallet, uh, we should make Web3 accessible, whether you're using Binance Smart Chain or Polygon or Ethereum or Solana, right? And, and then that can go cross-chain into these different ecosystems uh, wherever they're supported. So there's a lot of onus on like, okay, multi-chain wallet with cross-chain attention token, right? And that's what okay. we're spending a lot of time now is like one beefing up and adding new advertising uh, products to the model, okay. but then uh -huh. also like, you know, integrating more on-chain utility too, like Makes in these sense. ecosystems. Makes sense. Got it, got it, got it. I mean, uh, I remember you actually commenting uh, I, when I created this meme, right? I mean, people actually uh, doing uh, the entire YouTube, YouTube premium thing just to avoid the ads. So uh, this was actually my question. Was it always a thing? Like, in, I mean, is it is it a model to bring people on board to Brave by, uh, you know, because that that sticks out, right? That sticks out for Brave because when you're playing YouTube, you have no interruptions, no ads. And even the even the ad for Brave was very creative. The guy points out you, you're going to you're going to click the skip button, right? But you don't have to when you come on Brave. So so how did that happen? Yeah, so I mean, I think some of this evolved with the market, right? Uh, and and you know, initially with our rewards model, or brave payments or whatever the first iteration was, it was like, okay, you own a website, you're a website owner, a publisher, you can be a part of this thing. But what we started to see was the creator economy took off, and I'm talking like 2017, 2018 now, where, right. okay, YouTube creators were were a thing, but now it's really kind of ramping up. And uh, at the same time, you started to see these policies uh, by YouTube where people were getting demonetized. They started raising their minimums on how much you can earn. And then they started to get into this new realm where it's like more like censorship where, okay, yeah. we're not going to monetize you if you're covering this content. And now it's like, okay, you're going to be suppressed from query results. All this discovery is going to, yeah, all yeah. these things are just a progression, right? And what we've been doing is we've adapted our model to like help to support creators, whether they're on YouTube, Twitch, or Twitter or Reddit even, or even GitHub, like and mm -hmm. adding OAuth support for users and those things, because you're all generating content, right? Like, and uh, whether it's inline tipping in the browser or automated Correct. tipping, right? Like these are things that you can do. And if, for us, the challenge has always been, can you make it easy? And there are some people that never want to do that. There's some people that just okay. want to collect bat. And for those people, we want to utilize, make it so that you can use bat to buy things or, you know, whether that's premium services from Brave, NFTs or other things like that, that are, mm -hmm. you know, becoming more utilized on the web too. So there's always this weird kind of balance between, okay, Brave is an open source uh, browser on Chromium open source code, which comes from the Google, you know, Chromium yeah, team. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and then we also support creators, which can be on YouTube, uh, even though we're kind of blocking ads and things like that. But again, this is like, there, there are scenarios in Brave where you will see ads by default too. Like if you go to like a search result page, right? Like yeah, and you're yeah. in our standard mode, you can turn that off by going to aggressive mode on Shields, by the way, Good if idea. you really want to like get rid of all of the advertising. Uh, but uh, but basically like our, our stance on it is that if it's like a third party advertisement from a, a different server, like a different company, et cetera, like, you know, that's collecting your data without you being aware of it, we're blocking that. But if it's like search ads on Google, you're on Google, like it's a different, it's a different environment, right? Like it's a different set of conditions for a user. And so there's this balance here between, you know, okay, you know, well, YouTube ads are third party serves. They have yeah, tons yeah, of trackers, yeah. et cetera, but you might go to like an NFL or another sports site where there are videos that are just part of the content stream and they're not even stitched exactly. in. They're just natively there, right? Like you're going to yeah, see those yeah, yeah, on break, yeah. right? Like there's a balance here because we, from our point of view, advertising, it, it, it gets a bad rap because there's a lot of bad behavior there, but it also does provide value to people. Like yeah. you can't ignore that fully. And, and, you know, given how much advertising has fueled the web. So like, it's a balance and, and we're, we've been pragmatic, but we're also, as long as we're respecting the user, like mm -hmm. as the first principle, like that's our North star, right? Like, and I mm -hmm. think that what's super interesting now with web three and with self-custody is that 
you know, with DeFi and other things, you're starting to have a sell uh, a user first principles from a browsing perspective, along with kind of financial empowerment, where people can start to like increase their personal wealth. They have new vehicles to better their lives from Web three that aren't typically there or are there, but they rely on all these intermediated parties in between, mm -hmm. and really it ends up just being exploitative. So like this is where I'm super excited right now is like we're almost at a place where you can start like quasi banking from the edge in your yeah, browser yeah, yeah. And earning a yield on that. It's nuts. Like, I love it. You know, like the fact that people can start to do this stuff. And I think, you know, we're want to be on the forefront of that, but we are in a different position too, because even when we did our token sale, we were one of the few projects that actually had a working product when we did our token launch. And, and so for us, it's always been a matter of, look, we've got real product with real users. And now we're even in a more different position with you know, nearly 60 million monthly active users of all mm -hmm. walks of life, right? Like my everybody has to use a browser. So when we surface things that are Web3 related, we have to keep that in mind and try to one, make it easy for people and two, uh, limit the risk exposure uh, because, you know, DeFi, I mean, I'm a DJ and I've, I've lived in this stuff, right? Like, and, 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 yeah, and there's, yeah, yeah. there's some super high risk stuff. Um, and, and so don't block that necessarily, but for features that you want to be really accessible, like really go for the gold and try and pick the best stuff there and, and, and really expose those risks to people so they know what they're getting into, but, but make them available because it's empowering. And I think lastly, like there's a real, there's a real opportunity for us. And I think this is a big thing across the industry where crypto has kind of been this pixie dust, like Rube Goldberg, very like overly technical uh, UX in, in, in crypto. And it, it, there is a lot of complexity to it, but realistically, I mean, you know, if you want this to be adopted by the mainstream, you have to demystify that. You have to treat crypto as, you know, a credit card rail option in a wallet and, and, and bring these things closer together because like 90% of users in a browser are making an e-commerce transaction. And a lot of those people are saving those credit card payment options are in the browser already. So if you're yeah, trusting yeah, yeah. the browser to save that, like, you know, you, you can start to dabble with crypto and we just have to make this stuff easy for people. And, and you know, it actually comes back to the whole point of trust, right? I mean, mm -hmm. So uh, if, you, if you just go back like uh, to the evolution and what Darwin says, and I mean, this I think is the evolution of the internet and how it is supposed to be, because now I see that uh, like uh, Gen Z, right? Gen Z is very crypto native uh, and they think in this uh, sort of crypto native way. And now uh, the entire um, you know workforce and freelancing and things like that are shifting wherein the power actually comes to the user and we go back to our primal days saying, I work on this project, I'm, I'm done with this, I move on to another. Now, if we connect this, this with Brave, it almost sort of becomes like a, a you know, create to earn platform, right? right. You, cre you, you create something, you add value to the end user, and then they view it, and there's another transaction that happens. So it's actually layering it on top, and this is just profound. So uh, am I right on that analogy or am I missing something there? No, I think you're right. I think there's another angle to it too. It's almost like in, in some ways, Brave is providing kind of like that additive value on the, on the kind of create to earn, but also backstopping uh, against a lot of the, uh, you know, over, over moderation of the internet that's going on right now. So for example, like this is something I've been having a lot of fun with, especially if people have been following my Twitter feed, uh, okay. where basically like on, we have this Brave News feature, right? On, yeah, on yeah. Brave, if you scroll yeah. down from the new tab page, we added on Android, we added in this ability to add custom RSS feeds to that. Um, and so I started to go crazy with like adding stuff that I know would get suppressed on YouTube and other vehicles. But the, the fun part is like, okay, wow, one, you can turn an RSS feed in, make an RSS feed from anything pretty much like a YouTube channel, Twitter uh, profile, uh, you know, anything, a website feeds, et cetera, right? So, um, so I started to add in all these different custom RSS feeds and I started thinking like, wow, okay, if I'm a creator, like, yeah, the, the discovery mechanism with the algorithm is there, but it's kind of heart wrenching when you see people that are producing quality content and information mm -hmm. that, that is getting suppressed that are basically begging people like, please subscribe, yes, please yes. like, because, yeah, yeah. you know, the algorithm, the algorithm, why should a content creator ever have to think about that, right? But and it's just, just bots, time right? times. 
Exactly. It's, it's, it's bizarre, right? Like, but, yeah. but what a creator would have to do is kind of balance these two things, right? Like, so um, one, you have that discovery from the native platform that you're creating content on, but, but secondarily, like, you could have your users or your audience basically adding your RSS feed in and knowing mm -hmm. that whenever I post something new to that, okay. regardless of what might happen on YouTube's algorithm, I know that Brave News is going to backstop and feature that in that feed for them. So, so it becomes a challenge correct, for us correct, to make correct, it. Correct. So how can we make that super easy for people that are following somebody? How can we make that easy for a creator to like click a button to just automatically add this to my newsfeed, right? Like, but, but these things are, are ways that Brave can help to kind of backstop against a lot of this, this, you know, moderation that's happening on the internet. Because yes, yes. I, I don't know, like I'm all for variety, like, and, and I'm kind of a free speech guy, like, you know, let all of the stuff come out there and critically think, right? Like, and, yes, you know, yes. Not to get political, but that's just kind of my take on it, right? And 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 I feel like when it, things get very dangerous, when you have a monolithic narrative that is the only one that's allowed to exist, which unfortunately, because so few companies have so much control over how content is hosted and discovered, um, we're in a scenario now where you're seeing this monolithic thing. Like I've never seen Infowars the way that they are right now with this current situation in Europe, mm -hmm. and, and, and how you can literally have like you know an entire network banned in the West soft band basically like and then um and even in europe right like uh from from getting information out and and it really kind of makes it so that you know there are long-term impacts from that that people look at technology different from you know real goods in the real world but it's all very connected and so you know i, I think there's a service and a duty for technology companies to allow information to live and let people let people weigh in on that information and let the users decide what they want to do with that information, whether they think it's BS or they think it's legit or whatever, give them the space to let it breathe and then let people critically think. Um, but, you know, I think that Bray can help with that regard too. And, and, you know, final thing, like, sorry, I'm droning on, but, but there's like, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah resiliency too, right? Like with content and, and Brave has this native IPFS integration. We saw mm -hmm. what they did with uh, Turkey with Wikipedia. Like when, when Turkish government was shutting down Wikipedia, they basically correct, backed correct, off correct. that by having, you know, IPFS accessible Wikipedia on, you know, IPFS. So like we have IPFS natively integrated in Brave. We're also adding Filecoin as an L1 very soon to the wallet support. So like, you know, we want to be there for creators to create resilient content. Um, and not necessarily abandon where they're at, like, but have something there in case stuff is the fan and you've got to have your content living somewhere, let information live and breathe, right? Like, and, and, you know, that gets into all these different traps now with the way that people freak out about stuff, but realistically, like no one else is really doing this in this way. Like, so, so let Brave do it, right? Exactly. And so it, it just, uh, you know, uh, it's just a recurring again, right? So we say that, uh, it, it is about uh, the end user. It is about uh, giving them the power because when, when I type about a blog, if I want to learn something, if I just go and type that on, on Chrome, all I find is like a bunch of articles and a bunch of advertised articles. And there is another stat that says that 80% of stats are wrong. Right? So <laughs> how, how do I decide? So right. let us decide. Let, let us know what it is. And that's how we understand. So... Um, uh, I don't know how much time you have, uh, Luke. I got time. I got time. Yeah. You, okay. Okay. So, uh, you know, uh, one more thing that I had in mind. So, so uh, do you think uh, it it will uh, it will be Web three? So it has to be Web three. Um, like like let's say like ten years down the line, will people have a choice to choose between um, uh, going completely uh, in a Web two based model where data is centralized and move on on Brave? Or will the Web2 companies also have to migrate to this model just to sustain in, in the market? So this is one thing that I was always wondering about. Yeah, I mean, I think like, uh, you know, we have a, a unique, not a unique, but an interesting position at Brave on this because we have been exposed to a lot of these companies, right? And and we're kind of becoming, we're going from being somebody that's saying, hey, this stuff's pretty cool to like having these companies reaching out to us as a potential technology partner because they want to learn more about it. And we've been in yeah. it for a long time. And I think what you're going to see is you're going to see on the user side, like right now, there's all this back and forth about, oh, my chain, your chain, blah, 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 and like knife fighting, yeah. right? Which is cool, I guess. Like, I, I don't know, I get in the mix with it sometimes. I mean, like we're, the company's blockchain agnostic, but I have feelings. Um, and so 
so you know but i think like that's short term right long term this will all get into some sdk where like a multi-chain sdk where chains are going to become more specialized for different things like maybe if i need like high execution and and, and throughput and low cost like maybe i'm doing certain uh payments on solana pay um uh through a multi-chain sdk and maybe for more other purposes i'm using you know ethereum or ethereum l2 or other things right like that's all abstracted from the user and it's integrated in an app from a developer and the knife fighting, the blood's on the ground, knife fights over. We've got, okay, some clear winners on L2s. We've got L2, all tell ones that are bringing mm -hmm. value. I don't think it's a zero sum game uh, at yeah. all. Like yeah. I think technology has proven that over time that there is no zero sum. I'm on a, a Windows computer. I see you've got like Apple earbuds, I think. Like we're all, you know, you right, yes, right? Yes. Like I think that's yes. good. Um, and then, you know, from the business perspective, uh, I think what you're going to start to seeing, and you're already seeing it, like Google has doing big data stuff stuff around web three and the blockchain space. Amazon is very in it, working on, you know, exploring this stuff, even big payment processors like Visa and, and you've got companies like PayPal, et cetera, that are branching into crypto. You've got this really interesting mix of both financial and, you know, uh, traditional technology that can leverage web three. I think it won't be web three, it'll just be the web. And I think mm -hmm. that, you know, they'll take pieces of this and, and, and incorporate it into existing business lines. Why? Because it brings value. Like you even have the Treasury Secretary of the U.S. saying Good there idea. is value that blockchain technology brings to the financial world and Joe Biden in the White House making executive orders. You, you mentioned this earlier about how much this has changed, right? Like I think like if you look at in 2018, I was at Ethereum Denver and they were giving out bumper stickers that said cryptocurrency is not a crime. We went from that to 2022, where you have executive orders from the White House <laughs> about crypto. And it's just it's just my it, it's such a shift. And it's such a, even in a down market, it's it's such a shift. I, I think that, you know, people will focus on building a tech, the froth will happen, whatever. Like th th this is not a zero sum game. This stuff will be integrated piecemeal, just like anybody viewing source code can see technology on the internet is a hodgepodge and some of it's really ugly. And that's how this stuff's gonna integrate over time because usually, you know, the cream rises to the top and the services, there's variety with that. And that's kind of how it should be, right? Like, so, you know, that's what I see happening long-term. I see, you know, finance will be using this. You'll Makes probably sense. see some forms of central bank digital currencies erupt. There's gonna be a lot of friction between, you know, those central bank digital currencies and traditional stable coins and crypto because that's the biggest threat to them, right? Like um, you might see some collaboration there too. Like who knows, right? Like I think this algorithmic stable coin stuff that's happening is waking people up to a lot of things, but also people are discovering that, you know, there have been situations oh, where type of, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> right. Like, like it's my first question when I go into meetings yeah. with like, you know, people and they mention stable coin, uh, algorithmic or, uh, you know, like, you know, is this backed by something collateral, right? Like, <laughs> like, yeah, uh, but, uh, but, you know, these are things that are are helping to also be a forcing function too, right? And, and I think that you know, there, if we're going into you know a macro situation where we're moving from kind of a unipolar uh, U.S. dollar as the global reserve currency to a multipolar, which you look at what happened to Russia, right? Like, yes, yes. I would have never guessed that an entire financial system would be unplugged from a lot of the, the market, right? Like, yeah, um, yeah. but but if you look at crypto, like outside of the stablecoin case, especially, uh, crypto is very well suited to work in a, a multipolar environment. Um, and I think that that's one of the advantages that crypto brings to the market. And I think that whereas there's a lot of concern right now in the market around like, oh, it's all going to zero, uh, you know, like, I really think that, you know, crypto is one of those things that bounces back quickly. And I think that in this kind of these kind of, you know, political situations in the world, like uh, crypto is going to further prove its value, because it's not tied to a national, it's not tied to a national entity, it is it is global by nature. Um, and you can tie stable coins to it, like that are, are a little more national, like, but at the fundamental core of crypto, it doesn't matter what country you're in, if you're in the system, like when you hit off, off ramps on ramps, that'll always be regulated, you can't like have that's just the way of the world, but like as more of the world becomes, you know, decentralized. And I think like, this is why I think like, when you look at our native wallet, it's a self custodial wallet. There's a yes. reason for that. Like yes. you have to make it available for everybody. Right. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. And, and you know, we're, we're even seeing how that has played out where all of a sudden, like if Euro stops working for parts of the world, right. Like how fast can we backstop stuff to make it work? Right. Like, and, and yeah, like politically, some things are becoming taboo depending on where you're sitting in the world, but 
those people still have to browse the internet. And if we don't do it, someone else is going to do it. And we want everybody to have a user first experience, right? So like, how can we help to provide service to the world, even in these weird dynamics that are there where silly things are happening that ultimately penalize people. If you look at like how sanctioning works, it's mm -hmm. never the people in charge that are really hit by it. It's always the people at the ground level. Good. It's just like with Good. tech where yeah, users yeah. are always the first ones to get exploited. Like, and, and so I think a lot of this kind of resonates across. And I think crypto is a great vehicle to help, you know, push this into a multipolar financial world uh, where, where, you know, people need access to cross-border funds and all this other good stuff that crypto can help with. Makes sense, makes sense. I actually love the way our podcast is going, right? Because we started from the ideology and then we went from the intro to what Brave is doing and tokens. And now we're actually looking at the macro perspective. So uh, so the macro perspective, this is great, which you just pointed out, right? I mean, the entire financial system and things like that, because uh, Ukraine, we, Ukraine, we raised the funds for, again, not going political, ju just uh, sharing thoughts. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we wouldn't have been able to, uh, you know, uh, raise so much of funds if it wasn't for crypto, right? It's it's just so seamless, things like that. But now is a question. Now is, the question is for me is uh, there, there's a lot of disturbances in the market, right? And uh, we know how the numbers are and we know how the charts are. So how, how you know, how does the penetration happen? Uh, is it through NFTs like... Um, uh, introducing people through NFTs. Hey, this is a cool JPEG, and you learn things. And how does how do like how does how do my parents get to know about uh, uh, this thing? Because my parents do know uh, they're using Brave because they don't have to get into the technicals. What about the other okay. stuff? Well, I think that's where that's where the real challenge is right now, and it's something that's been overlooked a lot in the industry. But you're starting to see it. And I don't just mean to trumpet Brave all the time, like because I mean there are examples of like user experience improvements, even like when I started using, this is a rough example, but like back in DeFi summer, I started using Instadap because they started to like make really complex DeFi strategies down to like a couple of clicks, right? Like yes, and yes. what we're seeing now with like Argent, right? Like with L2s where like, okay, cool. Here are some ways that we can make it really easy to get in. Or even Yat has like the super simple like purchase flow that's really awesome, right? Like, and I think with Brave, what we can do is take some of the learnings that we have around, you know, a couple of clicks to passively earn fat from advertising in the browser, like apply those to how, how can you get crypto into a wallet? How can you put crypto near traditional payments and make it easy for people that want to start using it? How can you add incentive models where people are earning crypto by using our wallet? So they don't necessarily even have to buy it. Um, but yeah. they can start to see the value. Uh, and because that's the stuff where it's super easy. If you can remove that burden of them having to like go through 50 hoops. And the thing has been super interesting to see. Like I used to, I was in this mental model, like just from, because okay. I've become kind of like this crypto consigliere with my family and friends. And I'm sure you have too, where like everybody, like when the market's frothy, everybody wants to learn how to buy crypto. Even people that told me this was a scam that was going to die yeah. a couple of years ago are now saying, hey, can you help me buy crypto? And my, my pattern for that used to be like, okay, I'll just send them to Coinbase because it's easy and it's super simple and people don't want to have to manage their own stuff. What I found recently, like the past six months is like, it takes like two and a half hours. I'm walking boomers through this, okay? Like boomers, but, but like I'm, it's taking me two and a half hours to get them from starting to where they can actually buy crypto. And yes, then yes. They're, knee, they're, they're kind of shot in the kneecaps when that happens because they can only spend like $50 a week or something. So like, not only have I spent this huge amount of time on this really kind of, this process has become very confusing for people um, and, and la laborers, you know, like, uh, it, but also once I get to the finish line, I can only buy 50 bucks. What is that? That's like less than a transaction fee on Ethereum on a bad day, right? Like this is just nuts, right? Like, and so then they actually tell me, hey, look, I saw this ad for Brave Wallet. And I'm like, why didn't I, why didn't I just show them this? And, and then like in 15 minutes, we had them going through and buying crypto through wire in our wallet. And, you know, given on ramps are very hit or miss, right? Like, I'm not going to, BS around that because that's just a truth. But now there's like ACH and SEPA and all these different ways to get crypto in there. But I think what you're starting to see is this, you know, as crypto gets more and more popular, like these sources that were like go-tos before are feeling a lot of the pain around like risk and fraud and things like that, that are making a lot more barriers that used to not be there. It used to be a lot easier. At the same time, we're seeing self-custody get to be easier. So and if I, the really interesting thing I was seeing is like just kind of walking older people through this stuff is that 
these are people that have a notebook next to their computer and are writing yes, down yes. financials when they're managing their balances. These are people that in the U.S. at least might have a gun safe. They're really, they understand how they have to, you know, protect their keys or other things, right? And so these concepts that I was putting in my own mental model were just bunk because, wait, no, they get it. I don't have to explain this to them. I just say, hey, save this somewhere and they save it somewhere. And it's actually getting easier to buy crypto, you know, in some respects and others that these on-ramps, it, it, there's work, there's work to be done there, right? Like, I think, I think everybody that works with them can see that and, and it's very hit or miss, but that said, I mean, like there are more and more options coming on to make it easier to on-ramp people there. So I think that you're starting to see this this transition happen. I think it's on us. Like, mm -hmm. th and this is something where I see Brave as being a really uh, important player. Some of these problems aren't very sexy problems to solve, right? Like, but yeah. if you can solve them, we haven't even come close to hitting the bell curve on crypto adoption, and and that's after seeing a massive amount of growth, right? Um, so got if it, we can it, make it, it super easy, you can open up this market to the world, and like what's going to happen then is insane, right? Like it's going to make this last cycle look like nothing, like uh, like the previous cycle, right? Like, like and, and I'm here for it. And I think everybody else is too. Like, but, but it's our thing to lose. Harder, and harder. I think if nobody does this, it's not going to get better. And it's always going to be this novel niche thing, but we don't want it to be that way. Like we want to kind of okay, solve okay, some okay. of these problems. Got it, got it, got it. So, I mean, uh, you know, do we, do we look at Brave as a browser and the wallet itself as two different entities? Or how does that work? I think the way we look at it is like open web, right? Like open web, native browser wallet, right? Like also search engine, right? So search browser wallet. And we have these other things that are with it. You know, we've started to build out a stack. So we have like Brave Talk, which is like a Zoom competitor with private, you know, okay, okay. Uh, a talking from the browser, VPN. Uh, and, and then we also have our ad ecosystem, right? Um, and so these other services are here, but they're there to help us like give an alternative to big tech. And so, but, but it's all based on this foundation of like an open web. Like we went to this place where everybody started building their own native app. And it, it all got very siloed and fragmented and the open web still exists, right? And I think that there's the, don't bet against the open web. Like, especially when you look at like, you know, mm -hmm. different countries across the globe where people have limited access, but they are always able to access the open web in some way, right? So I think we look at it as like, okay, user first open web, uh, what, what pieces do you want with that? You want to have a good native wallet that doesn't lead you to downloading the wrong extension. You want to have, you know, a search engine that's private, that is is an independent index that isn't controlled by big tech. Um, and, and, and then you want to do all of this in the open with open source technology, a really strong ethos and people constantly waiting for the other shooter drop because that's what we are not out there making small statements. We're out there trying to improve things and show okay. alternatives are there. And those, those yep. alternatives are to massive companies that are, you know, huge. Yep. <laughs> and so, yep. so people, there's a natural, uh, uh, there's a natural, you know, waiting for somebody to say, gotcha. Like, oh, I saw Brave is taking advantage of this. Oh, oh, I see this has been, I was right. I told you so. Right. And I think for us, it's like, you, you know that things are going to happen. Like you're never going to have a perfect thing. So when stuff does happen, be really fast to explain what happened, be really fast to fix it, and then be really fast to tell people what you're doing to like okay. avoid that from happening and build in the open. Okay. Like that's what you can do, you know? Okay, okay. Yeah. So we actually come to the last part of the interview where and uh, sure. ask you some, uh, like uh, one question where and um, you just tell me. So, so um, what is your advice for, uh, let's say a 20 year old uh, in the space, right? He just stepped in, uh, wants to know what it is and what's your advice for, for those people, right? The young ones who just stepped in and want to do something in the space. So, so what, what are your thoughts? What, what would be your best advice? Do your own research. Uh, uh, make sure you, you always are measuring twice. Um, but, but really like crypto is one of those things where they are starting to teach it in schools, but the best way to learn it is by doing it. And so, you know, really kind of look at who the, the, the leaders in the space are, who the builders in the space are, what everybody's talking about and start to play with the technology, right? Like, and, you know, do things small, test with small amounts, uh, uh, do it from Brave if you want, <laughs> of course. Uh, but, yeah. uh, but, but realistically, it's like, this is one of those things where, 
not only is there a cool way for developers to get started into this new technology, but also the industry is in real need of people from, you know, other disciplines to come in, like business people, like other folks to help to, to make this more formal too. So there's a lot of opportunity there. But learning this stuff, you've never had a time in history where this much information is available and this many tutorials right. and this many things. And so it's always like, look, if it sounds too good to be true, most of the time it is, verify it see if it is or not the technology is there to do that now uh you know and then and then just don't fall for traps like if it seems really too good but to be true like always measure twice always make sure you're at the right page etc like uh all those kind of do's do's and don'ts yeah and don't buy luna (laughs) (laughs) 2.0 not financial advice though (laughs) try and have something backed by something that's like Yeah, yeah. yeah 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 if it sounds too good to be true or you know yeah 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 yeah. I, I, I like fungible yes. stuff and, and, right. and NFTs too like are, are fun too, but you know, there's a lot of hype with it and uh, okay, okay. you know, never, never be afraid to lose what you're putting into it. I think too is the other thing. So uh, one last thing, I just had to ask this. So uh, do you, do you own any NFTs? So uh, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like uh, yeah, I, my, yeah. I, I'm my, uh, I'm embarrassingly crypto heavy in my portfolio. Um, okay, and okay. Uh, I, I haven't been like, I'm not like an NFT degen. Like I've gotten them mm-hmm. because when I'd be working with them and also like, just kind of like studying it, like I'm way, way into DeFi. Like uh, that's where, where my bug was. And, uh, but, but I love what NFTs do as a technology. I think like coming from, you know, publishing media and coming from advertising, the ability to have one piece of technology that can do so many things is, is, is a new th- thing that things are going to upgrade to whether we call it nft in a product or not it's going to be there right like and uh so yeah i have some nfts uh uh, we we've been we actually partnered with magic eden too like for bat nfts so you can use bat to buy nfts um and we're kind of building a market there with that and uh and but i think from a browser perspective like we're working on things that'll like unlock the power of nfts for creators and for users to use nfts when they're browsing and doing other things okay 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 Got it. Uh, actually, I, I I'm just having a power outage, but uh, oh no yeah, worries, man. I'll just I'll just put my avatar on. This is I think cool. you, I, that's the I think that's the best time to show off my NFT. <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So it's 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 great. It was great, Luke. Uh, you know, talking to you and exchanging ideas and learning more about uh, uh, how we are building the space and. Um, there is a lot, right? Uh, that's what you're saying. We're, we're just in the initial stages, and there's a lot more to gain in the space. And uh, yeah, it was it was it was an amazing talk. Yeah, thanks for having me on. And you know, if anybody's interested, check out Brave.com. And uh, I'm just Luke Mulks, uh, L-U-K-E-M-U-L-K-S on Twitter. My DMs are open. If anybody's ever curious, uh, drop us a line. We're out there. And uh, thanks so much for having me on. Really appreciate it. Yeah, for sure, for sure, Luke. Yeah, we'll meet again then. Thank you so much again. All right. Yeah. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Yeah.